Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is Analog Circuits for Music Synthesis. Previously in this lecture series, we've looked at circuits that can generate sawtooth waveforms and circuits that turn those sawtooths into triangles. And then we looked at circuits that natively generate triangle waveforms. So today we're going to complete the square by learning how to turn triangle waveforms into sawtooth waveforms. One property of the Bukla 259 that we looked at that it shares with other triangle core oscillators is that it generates a nice square wave as a byproduct of generating the triangle wave. So to try to derive a sawtooth wave, let's imagine that during the first part of the square wave here, when the square wave is high, we let the triangle wave pass through without messing with it. But during the part of the wave where the square wave is low, we do two things at the same time. One is we flip the waveform upside down, but we also shift it to match up with the part of the wave that we didn't change. And if we line this up right, we find that we've derived a sawtooth wave. You could say that during the high part of the wave, we would flip and vertically shift this part of the waveform. Or maybe you're doing something of a hybrid where during one part of the waveform you are flipping and shifting vertically, but during the other part you're also doing some vertical shifting, and that's fine as long as you get it to match up in the middle here. And in any case, there's usually some additional scaling and shifting that's needed after doing this stitching operation. And in general, this is a little trickier to get right than the sawtooth to triangle transformation we looked at last time. That basically just involved rectifying the sawtooth wave and then doing some scaling and shifting. Here, if you shift a little bit too far, you can wind up with these glitches in the waveform that you see something like this. And you can also get a different kind of glitch if you wind up not shifting far enough. So there's usually some trim pots you need to adjust in order to get this right. As a first example of an implementation, I would like to look at the complex VCO from the Bergfortron. And as you might guess from the title complex VCO, this is highly inspired by the Buchla complex waveform generator. The Bergfortron is one of the most ambitious do-it-yourself synthesizer efforts that I've ever seen. And it looks amazing. I mean, just look at that. Look at it. So here is part of the wave shaping circuitry on the Bergfotron. We have some sort of square wave coming in and some sort of triangle wave coming in. And we know that these need a little bit of work. Notice that there's some inverting and scaling happening here with the square. And it also needs a little bit of shifting, which we see as being facilitated by this trimmer over here. The triangle wave itself winds up getting shifted and scaled and inverted by this op-amp configuration here. And all of the outputs have a 1K resistor at the output of an op-amp, providing a 1K output impedance, just in case somebody decides to, say, do something silly like short two of the outputs together, or somebody accidentally shorts one of the output to ground, you wind up not making the op-amps get too hot and too unhappy. Okay, so what about the sawtooth output? Well, we have the triangle wave coming in, and it branches off in two directions. One of them goes to the negative terminal through this 20K resistor, and then we also have it going through the CMOS switch here, through this complicated network, and into the positive input of the op amp. I probably should have mentioned it before, and it's probably obvious, but the circles with the plus and minus inside of them represent the positive and negative voltage supplies of the Bergfotron, and these little thick minus sign-looking things represent ground. That's what they're using for ground instead of multiple lines in this usual way. Anyway, you have two situations that you need to analyze. One is when the CMOS switch is off, in which case this 15K is disconnected and is left out of the circuit entirely, or there's a situation where the CMOS switch is on. Now, I'm not going to go through that analysis here. It's tedious, but it's not difficult in the sense that you can just use all of your various circuit theory rules. And notice that whatever influence the application of the positive supply here has, it's not 
very much. It's a pretty subtle thing because this is a 4.7 mega ohm resistor. So it's just doing a little bit of whatever it is that it's doing. And the CMOS switch itself is being switched on and off by the square wave. Notice that even after going through all of that shenanigans, we do need an additional shifting and scaling stage that's trimmed by this potentiometer right here. I mentioned before that the Bergvertron Advanced VCO is heavily inspired by the Bukla 259, although it certainly has a lot of its own special sauce, like these various specialized woodwind waveforms. Anyway, the reason I wanted to go to the web page here was so that we could actually take a look at the VCO core schematic. And as you can see, this matches up pretty well with a lot of what's in the 259 schematic. So this is a good place to go if you want to find a clean schematic of this kind of circuit. Now in our main triangle core lecture, we looked at the principal oscillator of the 259. But if we take a look at the modulation oscillator, we'll see that it's pretty similar to the principal oscillator. Here's that primitive OTA core. Here's the integrating capacitor. Here's the network that defines the comparator output when the comparator output goes into its tri-state disconnected mode. Let me zoom in a bit. Now if we go down here, we'll see that there's a CMOS switch. If we take a look at that, we'll see that there's something about this chip over here that's, that's turning various switches on and off. And to get a guess as to what these do, if we scroll down a little bit more, we see that there's LEDs, I guess, to indicate if we're choosing a triangle, sawtooth, or a square wave output. Now, the Bergfitron just brought all of these waveforms out as separate outputs, but here it looks like the 259 has an explicit way of choosing it. And I should mention that the 259 itself was a particularly special design compared to some of the other 200 series modules because it was designed to have some digital computer control. That's particularly indicated by this little thing here that says jumper for 300 series. The 300 series was basically Buchla 200 modules controlled by a computer. So this had special features to facilitate that control. When people are building a 259 nowadays, they often leave a lot of that circuitry out. But anyway, let's trace that back up. And we see the various switches. And one of them, it looks like it involves this CMOS switch right here. So my conjecture is that the CMOS switch is part of the triangle to saw conversion. Now, I would want to analyze the circuit in more detail to confirm that, but that's my guess. And interestingly, the sawtooth waveform is only available on the modulation oscillator in the 259. It's not available on the principal oscillator. For another example, I would like to talk about the Moog Sonic 6. This is a strange beast. It wasn't really a Moog design. If I recall correctly, the company that created the design basically bought Moog Music and rebranded it with the Moog branding, which is why it looks different than most of the other Moog synthesizers that I've seen. And certainly the internal circuitry is different than most of the Moog designs that I've looked at. So interpreting the diagram here, if you look at the rest of the schematic, you find out that a triangle wave is coming in from the north part of the schematic up here. And there's a switch over here driving this 741, which is just acting as a voltage buffer. And the user can switch between that triangle wave or a sawtooth wave or a square wave. Now, an interesting thing about this is that unlike in the Bukla 259 design that we looked at, the Sonic 6 isn't taking its square wave out of the comparator in the core directly. Instead, there's a 741 sitting here that's serving as a comparator on the triangle wave that it's using to generate this square wave. So even before we talk about generating the sawtooth wave, that's a little bit of a difference in the design. So we know there's a triangle wave coming in here. Part of that triangle wave is coming into the negative terminal through this 10K resistor, and we have a 20K resistor in the feedback loop. And part of the triangle is also going to the positive input here of the op amp through this 10K resistor. Or maybe not, because we have this JFET here that's being used as a switch. We've seen a JFET being used as a switch before 
it was used to reset the sawtooth in the sawtooth VCO core that we looked at previously. Although you can't really see it on the schematic, the raw square wave output that's being generated by the triangle wave core is used to switch this FET on and off. When it's switched off, basically whatever voltage we find here is replicated here because assuming that the 741 is operating as an ideal op amp, there's no current flowing through the positive terminal and no current flowing through the JFET since we turned it off. So there's no voltage being dropped across the 10K resistor. But if the JFET is switched on during that part of the waveform, the positive terminal here is effectively grounded. Again, here I'm not going to go through all of the math of all the variations. It's straightforward circuit analysis if you know how to handle op amps. One thing that's a little bit misleading is the fact that they drew this ground here. If I was drawing the schematic, I would probably draw a ground here, and then I would draw a ground here. To make it clear that this isn't an attempt to couple this 10K pot to this 15K resistor in any way, these are really separate things. And actually, if I were drawing this, what I would do is I would take the V plus here and draw that up here somewhere. And then I would take the pot and draw that to ground down here. I think it would make it a lot easier to see what this voltage divider here is doing. Basically, it's setting the threshold level for the square wave. And I haven't looked at the front panel. I don't know if there's a separate PWM knob. By the fact that this has the word quality here, that suggests to me that this is an internal trim pot. And at the factory, they trim this to be a 50% duty cycle rectangle wave. I'm not sure. I'll have to go look at that later. Anyway, the other thing that's a little bit of a mystery to me is R83 here. So is there a plus V designation that's missing here? And that's what that's supposed to connect to? Or is it connecting somewhere else? I'm not sure. Anyway, to more thoroughly analyze the circuit, you would have to look at that. Certainly, they're putting a lot of attention on this. Notice that these are all resistors, which were pricey back in the day. And they're making a big deal about this being a metal film resistor, too. Hmm. So I'm not really sure what this guy is doing. Anyway, hopefully you get the gist.